anything. You can lose your job today for no reason. You can, the electricity could go out, blah, blah, blah. Listen, we could, who cares, right? What are you going to do? Like, what would you do with this time? Because it, 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 it all started like some, the time is finite, right? Not to be dramatic, but however you end it, that's how you end it. But in that time, what you do is what counts. And so all that stuff is nice, but really like, what are we going to do right now? And that's why like, I just want to, being able to focus on what we're doing today and now is the most important thing. All right, Vladimir, thanks for joining me today. Good to be here, Artie. Yeah, so I know you as a guy trying to get a, a million kids to build robots and learn about robotics. Uh, is there anything else you'd like listeners who might not be familiar with you to know about you? I'm Vladimir. I teach kids to build robots. Our mission, believe it or not, is to teach 10 million kids. So you oh. heard part of it, right? 10 million kids teach and inspire 10 million children to build robots in the next 10 years. It's a long mission. We are hardly eight months into it. And what we've done is we've taught over a thousand kids. We've uh, found out what it is that the kids and the parents like. We're really believing we're connecting it to the future mission of where the world is going and where we all are going. And that's why I'm here on X, because that's the place that best connects to it. And um, we're here to do that right now and to take big steps toward doing that. It's important because I, children, of course, are the future. Children are going to build our future as they get older and as we uh, you know, require, you know, need them to build for us. And robotics is the future, right? We know, we know for a fact, you can disagree, we can have this argument, but wh robots are coming to build things for us, to do the hard work for us. And I want to be one of the people that helps connect the future generation with the need for creating this, uh, this robotics so that we don't have to do any more work. The robots can do all the work for us. Yeah, I love it. And you have such you have so much energy you have so much passion where did the passion for well where did you come up with the goal like how do you come up with the goal of 10 million robots uh in children's hands like 10 million children building robots where do you actually come up with that goal how how did that happen that's the number that i believe if there were that many more engineers in 10 years uh who are focused on robotics then they will build enough machines to do all the work for us. Awesome. If the number happens to be a million, great, we'll overshoot it. If it's a hundred million, then we will have gotten 10% of the way there and we'll need everybody else's help to get there. But according to my preliminary math as a startup, you know, that's what we need to change the world, to have the engineers on a global scale. And I'm talking about throughout the world, everywhere, uh, that will build these machines and build the next generation, build the future. Yeah. That's why that number is what it is. Uh, how do you get your start? Like I know early, early in your life, you were born, was it in Ukraine? I was born in Russia, well, in the USSR. Okay, USSR. In uh, 1987, yeah. January 28th, 1987. And then we moved to Canada. I was eight years old. It was December 27th, 1995. So I think, of, so it's 30 years now, I think I've been here. Um, yeah, I think I... Uh, I want to live in Canada, I want to die in Canada, and I want to build my part of Canada here. That's sort of my mission. Um, and big changes are, are, uh, are part of life. So you were uh, seven or eight when you moved? Yeah. To Canada. I distinctly remember that day. I remember coming here and landing in the airport. And we you know we learned a few English words in Russia when I was, before I came over. But I remember seeing all this other language, and that language was French in the airport and all these other words that I didn't understand bienvenue. And I was like, what is this? And I was eight, just like, why did I learn all these English things? And anyway, I was tired, but I remember this, I was just struck by the amount of French that was here. And that was awesome. Cause I, I remember kind of, uh, ending up learning more French. I used to think Jean Vier was just a, some famous French person. Cause we were there in January learning French and that was everywhere. Like I, anyway, it was crazy. <laughs> so you can speak French. Fluently I, I mean, I can speak enough that if I, you know, I've been to France, I've been able to order food, talk to people nice. on the street. Can I write a book? No, no chance. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So did your interest in robotics and programming start uh, in the USSR or did it start uh, after? Not a, I mean, my, my dad was one, he was lucky to be a software developer mm. for Novell, uh, you know, in the early 90s in the USSR. Very few people got the chance to, to work with, uh, with companies like that back then. And so he had a computer at home. And I just remember like playing little like cannon games that, that, that like shot, but not really robotics. I'd see my dad tinkering around and, you know, 
building little things, but um, that got me like inspired. And then over time, I kind of played more with programming, I would say, than anything programming, some Lego, this and that. But it wasn't like till age 16 that I started like uh, making, let's say, websites or things for other people. And then by robotics didn't come until my 30s. I was just I was mm -hmm. doing more, more, uh, well, to different degrees, you know, not not to the professional degree. Anyway, it was always like a little hobby with more logic based things uh, that I really enjoyed, like programming. That was like where I really what I enjoyed. And I also ran a recording studio from age 18 to 24. Uh, worked with some Grammy winning artists, worked with Rob Ford's body double. Uh, we'll get into that at some point. Um, robotics came, this is there was it's very small. At one point in my life, a few years ago, I wanted to have a button that sits on my desk that I can press that will light up a green light that says when I'm busy. So that people can know that I'm busy. And they will track my time with that light. It, it'll put that time on the spreadsheet on off on off, not for a company, but for yourself, because, okay, sure. There's time tracking software. You can press start and just leave it on all day. Cause you're working. That doesn't tell you what you're doing. So I wanted to build that thing for myself. And I started to learn how to build that little device. And that got me into it. Last year I was running an e-commerce company, uh, uh, an e-commerce startup, not a particularly successful one, but at the time I was telling my wife, once we make it, once we become startup successes, I'm going to teach kids to build robots because uh, that's what's fun. One, my son is heavily into it. Uh, my son is five. His name is Andre. He loves building robots. He's into science. But I also saw Elon Musk's video where he's teaching kids from first principles, rocket science. Yeah. And I thought that is amazing. This is what I want to do. It doesn't, we don't have to wait till they're too old to be inspired. I mean, you can be inspired at any age, but when you're inspired as a, you know, like you don't want to miss being 12 and being told when you're five, sure. You can get to it when you're 30, like me, that's, that's cool. But imagine I got into it when I was like eight. So yeah. uh, that's what we want to do with kids is we want to inspire them. And so as I'm running this e-commerce startup this past January, it must've been January 29th, the day after my birthday school, uh, my son's school calls and says, would you like to teach a robotics class at our school? Cause we know you're into this stuff. And I was like, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. I've been talking about this. And so, so I said, yes. So we had 15 kids sign up. We did a few weeks of it. Everybody loved it. It was some of the, the, one of the most fun things I've ever done. And so then we went into five schools. And I said to my wife, well, why are we going to do all this e-commerce stuff if I don't, if I, what I want to do with my time when we get there is to teach kids to build robots. And so that's what we're doing. Just got into doing that. We're in schools, we're doing that. And then also what I realized is to make this vision, to get to the scale of making a massive change and why it's happening. Not just that I enjoy teaching kids, because of course I do, but to, to make a, the, the change on a massive scale, that's when I realized it has to be. 10 million kids yeah. it has to be 10 million children because that's the number that's actually going to make a difference. And that's when I started thinking of how do we achieve that vision? How do we bring that to the world and use leverage, you know, the platforms that we have, the tools such as X, X, not just such as X specifically, how do I use X to get this message out to the world? And that's what I've been doing. It's, and there are many ways to do it. You have to capture people's attention. You then have to have them understand why you're doing it and then ultimately uh, get them to act, which is, we're here to teach 10 million kids to build robots so that they can build our future. And then all you got to do is just follow me on X and we're going to do it together. That's the mission. Awesome. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Like it, it's so cool to teach kids at a younger age. Um, I'm like you, I've, I've tried to like learn a lot of things in my twenties and thirties. I'll learn more in my forties. I'm always trying to learn new things, but sometimes I look back and I'm like, uh, it would have been awesome to learn this when I was a young kid and I didn't have all of these other responsibilities around me. I play a little piano. It'd be awesome to have learned that when I was younger. I uh, try to code a little bit. I would have loved to learn that when I was younger. But, I mean, obviously you do what you can. You learn when you can if you don't get the opportunity when you're younger. But uh, I agree with you completely that you have to... It's best to teach kids when they're younger and you know they're not going to like you said they're they might not build a rocket like a massive rocket and be working at spacex at the age of 12 or anything like that but you can learn the concepts early and i think that's such a great way to nurture the younger generation of like how to get the, their feet underneath them for if they want to pursue this mm -hmm. stuff um, now it's IT. Yeah. We're going to have RT, robot technology. 
Yeah. Kids are going to want to get into the RT field the way the IT field has paid off in the past, right? That's It's going to be like that, where it's it's the norm. Working in robotics, we consider it crazy this and that, but we already live in a time of magic by 30 years ago. So yeah. 30 years from now, it's just going to be regular tech, but we just happen to, to, to have built it knowing that that's where it's going. Yeah, no, the... I mean, what you just said about we're living in a time of magic is absolutely true. I mean, the uh, the SpaceX videos where you see those rockets re-landing, like yeah. landing after, like, that is unbelievable. I just showed my girlfriend a video. I'm like, have you seen this stuff yet? Because she's not on X, you know, so she's not seeing all this. Like, all the other platforms are not typically seeing this stuff as much as we are. And it's amazing because like, yeah, this is world class. This is this is the limit of what humans are doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you, <laughs> if you want to, uh, the conspiracy theorists have something going for them. Cause it looks unreal when you see it. Like, it's like the people who want to act like, uh, you know, the world is flat and space travel doesn't really exist. They can actually, I mean, there's too many witnesses for it to not be real, but like just the video alone, it's like, <laughs> you know, if I was shown that the first time, I could understand somebody being like, "No, nah, that's that's not real." But yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. Um, how important it is is it for you to say yes to things? Like, how different would it be had you not said yes to the opportunity to teach robotics at your kid's school? It's more important to say no. Hmm. I say yes way too easily. I, I enjoy doing things, and that's a problem. Uh, I find it's way more important to say no to, to just about everything else because there's there's a hundred things that I could have said yes to that would have prevented that. So yeah. it's easy to say yes to the thing that that you like. But then the problem is, so this is the thing. I had this conversation with my son. I'm like, do you like ice cream? He's like, yeah. Do you like watching TV? Yeah. Do you like swimming? Mm -hmm. Do you like basketball? Mm -hmm. Do you like to build? Yeah. Can you do them all at the same time? No. And his eyes were like, like oh, my God, I can't do all the good things at the same time. So that's why I'm like, <laughs> OK, uh, it's not saying yes. Saying yes to good things is easy. You look around, find a friend, go out. Like saying yes to that is 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 really easy. You have a fun thing to do. Yes, but there is so much of it in the world that we're surrounded by, and it's a blessing and a curse in that our friends are so close to us with the tools that we have. All yeah. the things we want are so close to us. So it's actually I find the opposite. I find saying no is much more what got me anywhere. I believe than saying yes. How do you know what to say yes to then? Like, how that's, do you, yeah. how do you determine that? That's probably the most important question in my life. And it's like, what can you sacrifice? And I believe it's something like this. Um, I forgot who said it recently. It might've been Michael Seibel from uh, Y Combinator that I listened to, but he said something like, I, and I, I might be, it might be the wrong person, but um, if the problem will kind of work itself out, if you just leave it, and it'll just disappear on its own. You probably don't need to do anything. You just, you just don't need to touch it. And to me, okay, there's three. Okay, this is like, this is my thinking again, highly opinionated, largely uneducated. Uh, there is like uh, short term, which is what I'm doing now. There's mid, middle term, which is uh, while you're alive. And then there's long term, which is when you're dead. Like that's, that's the, the real long term. It's not, long term isn't 10 years. Long term is after you die. So what is the thing that you if you look back from this point back that you should have done. And that's the point of the 100 days. You know, we're going 100% for 100 days right now. The point is what would if you did the thing that you would do, right? Look, it's, it's, you know, you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm this guy. I do this in this situation. I do that in this situation. So if I can look back when I'm dead, I mean, I can't, but theoretically, this is the thought, and look back at this person, what should this person be doing if everybody's watching it, if, if everybody's watching. And it's actually then you see that most stuff you don't need to do. Hmm. You just literally, it makes zero difference. You, it just doesn't need to be done. No. Were you always uh, this thoughtful with your time or did that change over your life? Cause like for me in my twenties, I wasted a lot of time just saying yes to parties and going out with friends, doing the social things that, not to say they weren't fun. I, I had some good times, but, uh, you know, a lot of partying, drinking, stuff like that. So a lot of wasted time too. 
I waste You're... a lot of time, but I waste it on my own terms. Yeah, yeah. But did you always think in these kind of terms, or yeah. did that change over time? Uh, no, I mean, uh, there is a part of me, I remember, like, walking around mowing the lawn when I was, like, 15, and a part of me is still exactly the same. Like, from the moment I was about five, there is a part that's been exactly the same, where... Like, I don't know, maybe I'm supposed to be an old man or something like that. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I'm not, you know what I mean? But there has always been a part where that it, it has not changed. There yeah. is emotional control to bring that part out and control it. But I would say, you know, um, I would say the core is exactly the same as it's been since I've been five. Uh, but the control of it is what's changed. Like the ability to, to control emotion, the ability to, to control, uh, like direct where your thoughts go uh have multiple thoughts at the same time like that kind of stuff but the core of it is the same i think i've been the exact same person for for 32 years yeah i was gonna ask you about that like what do you obviously your core has been the same but like what are your principles or what qualities of yours have remained consistent while what has changed over the years um i think this, I've always realized and not just known that uh, you're going to die <laughs> and yeah. not from like, ooh, perspective, but that time is limited and that that makes me not care what anybody, including me, thinks. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> so it's almost like, and, and that is a sort of calming sense. It makes me very calm knowing that I can just do what I'm going to do. And it's going to be as awesome as I make it. And that's all that counts. And so it's like, it, it's just like, it makes me not have to look for other things. Like I'm not looking for things. Right. So I just, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to do it. Then I'm going to die. It's, it's pretty, and I, and like, I say this, like, I'm looking forward to the, to the life that we're going to, that we're going to have. Right. Like, yeah. That's how I say it. And I find that calming. I don't know. I, but, but I also find when I say this, I do have a disconnect with people and that I don't find many people in the, where I can relate with this. I can relate to it. I think, uh, not many. That's what I mean. This yeah, is why yeah. there are some people that really, that I, that I, that I see that in, um, I don't know, but I'm also like, you know, like I'm, I'm not, I'm a, I'm socially awkward. I don't necessarily know what's going on. I kind of, yeah. if I know you for five years, I'll eventually know what you're thinking. Right. Cause we just talk that long. So, yeah. yeah I mean, well, death is, um, uh, it's an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people, but, the reality is, like you said, we're all going to die eventually. Like it is one of the guarantees in life. And it's actually what propels us to achieve in the lifespan that we had. Like if we didn't have death around the corner, then we would just sit there watching Netflix, putting off what we need to do or w what we should do indefinitely because there's no rush. That the inevitability of death is, I believe, what ultimately compels us to like move forward and do something it's like i only have this much time at best so i'm going to do something with that time and not that everyone does i mean we we live in a, a society of a lot of luxuries and we can waste time on various things and i definitely waste my own time at times but that reality that death is going to happen at some point is I believe why we try to achieve things while we're here on earth. Would you and, agree with that? I think a good way to, to not scare yourself is to not use the word. It's, it's more to say there's a limited amount of time. Like that's just yeah. the reality. You don't yeah. get infinite tries. And if you think you're going to live forever, the odds of you being hit by lightning are a hundred percent. So yeah. it's, you know, you sort of have to, I don't know, man, I don't know what I'm talking about, but that's how I think. Yeah. Uh, what do you, like you were seven when, or seven or eight when you moved from Russia. What do you, uh, what has stayed with you from your early days uh, before you moved to Canada? Like what in Russia? Because I'm a fan of Russian literature. I I know a little Russian language. I find the culture fascinating. Uh, Russian literature is always so deep to me. I I just find it so interesting. I'm just curious. Having moved when you were seven or eight, what, is there anything that really stuck with you from your time there? It's hard to say. Like when you're that young, I mean, you don't really have a, a, a holistic perspective. I remember no. running around buying gum at the stand, you know, for 200 rubles. Like uh, that to me is um, 
I would say it's not from Russia. It's just from my childhood. Like, um, I think with a lot of people, a lot of people can relate. Like we, uh, like my family didn't have a lot of money, but we never felt poor. Hmm. Like I never right now feel any, like I have any more than I ever did. Like I've always felt like I have the same, whether I had zero or, or whatever. Uh, so, and so, and, and so in terms of the question, like in terms of Russia, like, you know, I left when I, when I was eight, I would say, so we came here when I was nine, I would say, uh, you know, there is a, the spirit of, uh, that it's not about what's happening now, but about kind of the, the long term, as I, as I said, that would be maybe what I carry at a high level, but in terms of specifics, like there is no real, like, uh, specific stereotypical Russian thing about me. I would say, I, I, I think, uh. Yeah, maybe just the spirit of. I don't really know. I don't. I don't even know what people consider Russian. To be honest, I just, you know, uh, I, I build stuff. I have a kid. I raise a family. Like I don't know. So I yeah. kind of. I don't. I don't look at it like that. Like this is. You know, we talked about labels. Like we talked about labels a while back, and sort of like I don't know what that label entails. Right? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Does that mean knowing us? You know, the culture, acting out the culture. Does that? What does that? What? What? What is that? That perception? And so, like to me, I. I am. Even if you ask me, are you an artist? As we often like to talk yeah. about, people ask each other, are you an artist or whatever? I can't tell you if I'm a thing that is a noun, but I can tell you what I do with my time. I can tell you that I spend X amount of hours sitting doing this. I can tell you that I, I do this. And then whatever label you want to put on that as far as, uh, you know, you're a little bit this, a little bit that in terms of perception, that's, you know what I mean? And I actually, I'm like, uh, like, that's why I have a hard time answering any kind of question as far as are you a like are yeah anyway but I don't maybe maybe I'm drifting a little no I I like it I, I partially from our conversations other partially from books I've read and stuff like that I've been trying to change the way I talk to about myself and to myself um, lately and coding is one of those things I had a habit of saying I'm not a coder you know and. I, I'm not a, I'm not somebody who can code anything, um, but I can. I can work my way around coding a little bit. I can use AI to build some basic stuff, and I can figure some things out. And uh, I, I've been trying to make sure that I don't say I'm not a coder anymore. I, I've been trying to avoid boxing myself in with my language um and we are what we do it's yeah. not what we say or how we label ourselves if you spend three hours coding you're a coder it doesn't yeah. mean you're a professional coder with yeah. a job in software it means you're just you're a coder if you went on a basketball court and you shot a ball you're a basketball player yeah. you're not a professional yet but you're a basketball player where did your mentality around labels come from when when did you start developing that mentality of or, or yeah, avoiding the labels and stuff like that. Cause I feel like for me, that was more in my late twenties, early thirties, probably. I'm, I, I don't think I ever thought about it until, so I don't know. I, I found that recently I, I have a higher sensitivity to the impact of words. And so I find when people say certain words, I have certain reactions. And then when I notice that, I'm like, I don't want to create those reactions. And those reactions tend to be around ambiguous labels. And English mm -hmm. has a lot of this. English has a mm -hmm. lot of ambiguous labeling, programmer, content, value. These things don't mean anything to me. Like, I don't know what, what content means. Like, I get what it means, but it doesn't mean anything. That's the format. That's, you know, it doesn't tell me what to do. It's like saying, it's like saying, go, uh, film a video. Okay. But that, that doesn't mean it's like saying, go breathe air. Like what's what, why, you know what I mean? So, um, I think by s the things you say impact yourself and others, uh, even on a small level, especially if you do it repeatedly. And so I don't know. I just find them. I, 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 I uh, I don't know. I tend to be careful with what I tell myself because I tend to believe myself. Your kid's five years old. Do you feel like having a child has uh, reinforced that even more? Because obviously, like yeah. when you're raising a kid, you have to be even more responsible with what you're saying. It it doesn't just impact you anymore. It's it's your child and how they're going to grow up. 
Uh, did you start paying even more attention to that as as your kids grown up? No, I think I've I've always I, I think I I I, I have um. I'm abnormally introspective. Like I overthink, like I'm thinking about thinking way too much. But what happened when I had a kid is that I started to realize what, what it means that what is a childish behavior? What is uniquely a baby behavior? And then when you see that in adults, you immediately start, okay, I can never do that again because that is uniquely a childish thing. And when you do that, you look like you're four, never do that again. So I started to see things that are uniquely childish that when you then see in adults, uh, it's a little off-putting sometimes. <laughs> but it's you know, uh, you know, you know what I mean. Like there's certain behaviors that only make sense when you're a child. And so when you when I raised the kid for long enough, like the certain stubbornnesses or this and that, like that just are not logical. They're just purely, uh, you know, emotional development. Anyway, that's kind of what I saw. Like I started to differentiate between children's behavior and adults behavior and there's a very there's there's a clear line now yeah. uh with coding how did you get into it you said uh you were building web pages and stuff like that around the age of 16 how did you first get into coding and how did you progress like i'm sure there's people listening that are you know maybe thinking about coding or they've you know, started to dabble into it, myself included. Like I've gotten to a certain point, but haven't gotten too much further. How did you start and how did you progress? Like what were, I mean, you can go into as much detail as you want, like with what languages, um, where your focus was, how did you approach it mentally, stuff like that? The languages are irrelevant. Um, what made me care is the project. So it's all about the project. If you don't care about the project, you'll never learn the language. Hmm. You'll never learn the tools. Uh, if you want to build the house, you won't care to carry bricks. You won't care to chop trees. You won't care to learn how to make them into flat planks. You're going to do all that stuff and you're going to enjoy it and you're going to learn it. If you're building a house that you don't even like, you're going to hate that whole part, kill yourself in the process and learn nothing. So it's all about the project from, you know, I, I when I was like 10, uh, I made a little basic thing, like a hundred uh, in basic, like a hundred lines of code. It was like, there was like um, some kind of shooting thing, like inspired by the little shooting cannon thing yeah. that, that, uh, that my dad had earlier. So just the same thing, just like that a cannon could shoot a ball and, and hit the other one. So I just made that. And then after that, I didn't make anything until I was like 16. I made some websites because it was fun, just because uh, the, the internet was coming up. And then I, I, I got paid for a couple, like two websites when I was 16, 17, made it a good $900. That was amazing. And then um, I got into making music. So I kind of stopped doing all that till I was about 24. And then basically um, decided to become more of an adult, got into software development, uh, took a boot camp, you know, to do that, you know, passion turning professionalism, as I like to say. And then yeah, worked on just worked away until I got better at stuff. But the things where I really learned was uh, picking projects um, that are that I care about. I care to finish this project. Therefore, I will do whatever it takes and learn whatever it takes to finish it. And it's not about the skill. Like if you're just doing to read a book or to have a course or to have a certification, you're not going to learn anything. There's like you might, but you're not going to really learn anything. Like you're yeah. not going to learn to really work through challenges. You may know what the words look like, but you're not going to know how it feels when a thing breaks for the third time and you have to deliver it in 16 minutes and the client is waiting and you still have to fix it because you're the guy that's getting paid X amount per hour to do it. So you won't know that no matter how many books you read. And that's way more important than whatever skill you're going to learn on your own. So um, it's all about the project and, and finding things that, that you care about to work on. But that's hard. That means you either have to come up with them and care enough to do it and then sacrifice other things or you have to get in on other people's projects and then you don't have that ownership, which is also hard because you care, but you don't get that feedback. You don't actually own it, which is a real thing because you don't you, that you can't care as much about what you don't own. So it's, it's actually kind of hard to do that. And, the, you know, so you just have to commit to something you like. You say, okay, I want to make this for this reason. I'm going to do it. Fuck it. That's it. Yeah, I like that. I mean, as I've gotten more into i've i've learned like a bunch of different aspects of coding and i i understand you know the different ways things have come together the back and the front end the database all that kind of stuff so i have a overview of it where i'm like okay i'm starting to understand this 
And uh, more and more lately, I'm just like talking to AI and like, okay, I kind of want to make this. I want to make this and this. And it definitely excites me more and I can waste, not waste. I can spend a whole weekend diving into coding because I'm actually interested in it versus going to a book or some program or something like that where it's, you know, we're going to build this and it's something I don't care about. We're just going through these motions and it's like, it can be informative, but I've found that I often drop those well before I get anywhere meaningful just because it's like, I don't care. And and people this, also approach the it wrong. Is meaningless. Especially when you approach it as something new. If you yeah. approach it, like, for example, the AI route, hey, Cursor, make me this app. That's wrong. What you should do is spend five hours and say, hey, Cursor, show me how apps work. Yeah. What is the structure of an app? What the hell am I doing? Spend five hours doing that. Then do the thing you were going to plan because now you'll know what, what you're doing. Mm. Nobody does that first part. They, they jump in and the first thing they say is make me the app. You don't even know the, what the language is. How about you say, Cursor, teach me how to code or whatever yeah. your app is. Uh, rep, whatever, whatever, you, whatever, whatever you're using. Chat GPT, explain to me the six things I need so that your output makes sense to me. I haven't seen one person do that in the two years that I've seen people use AI, right? Please yeah. tell me what I need to know to understand your output. Nobody does that, literally nobody, and it's ridiculous. Well, yeah, and honestly, the, the capabilities of AI are not to the point where you can typically build an app by just saying build this app because the it, it can't follow the logic between different pages of the application uh, of the code and everything okay. like that. People just um, don't know how to use it. You have to know how to use XML, XML structure. Like there is, a, listen, there is a way to do it. Is it world-class deployable at a Morgan Stanley? No. It, yeah. Can a developer who spends 10 hours to make an app make an app in six? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Cool. But can a developer who has never made an app make an app in a day uh, predictably and say uh, to a customer, I'm going to charge you $2,000 and deliver in 24 hours and I've never made an app, but I'm going to, no, there's no chance. Uh, yeah. Certainly not if you want to be uh, professional about it. Hmm. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but not predictably. You don't know. Just like when you tell an LLM, generate me an image of a dragon. Well, you don't really know what that dragon's going to look like and whether he has three claws, nine, or whatever, right? So, yeah, same with programming. Yeah. Um, you said you went to a boot camp. Do you think there's a... Do you think it depends on the person, or is there generally a better... A uh, way for somebody to approach being a professional coder. Do you think boot camp versus college versus self-taught? Do you think that just depends on the person, or is there an actual better path for people in general? At some point, for you to have the confidence to know that what you're doing is right, you need to have people who've done it tell you that what you're doing is right, having looked at your stuff. So hmm. for me, I, I I already knew a lot of that stuff. But what happened is I had people who've done it professionally and been paid by other people to do it and know what they're doing. They then look at what I'm doing, my code, the output, like the actual results that, you know, what the visuals come out like and say, okay, well, this is what you need to do in order. Like, this is what happens in a professional setting. If you want to work at a company X where they do this, this is the structure. And so although you have these skills, this is the way you need to operate. And these assumptions you have are right. Yes. And just knowing that makes me confident because then I can focus on that. I can, I can say, okay, now I know it. I don't need to keep learning this. I know, I already know it to the full. And so having somebody who you trust tell you that you're right is really important at the beginning, mm -hmm. right? And that's why I think I don't know that it's possible at all to not have, whether it's like, I don't have a, like a mentor or whatever, but to have either a mentor or a teacher or have taken a class or something where somebody that is, who knows the state of the art where that person can tell you you're doing state of the art, because then you can calm down and say, am I thinking is correct? When you know your thinking is correct, you'll learn anything, right? It's like, if you doubt the way that you're getting there, you're going to doubt yourself. But the moment you know the way you got there is correct, it's all on you. And that's the key. And that's what it, it gave me is like, yes, I learned a lot of skills, but also uh, the people that taught it and the people that sort of looked at my work were, they said, you know, this is the difference between amateur hour and professional and then my next job was coca-cola and so that's that's the difference yeah what is a uh, 100 percent for 100 days can you i mean you touch on it but uh anyone that's listening to this that's not on x and might not be following you yet might not be completely familiar with what you're doing so can you dive into that a bit 
in short, I challenge you to give it 100% for 100 days. And it sounds like a lot, but then don't we tell ourselves we give it 100% every day? So then when I tell people this and they say, really, you're giving it 100%, I am flabbergasted and I say, what are you doing? How are you consciously not giving it 100%? Like, and so I, I want to highlight that. And I want to highlight that there's an opportunity. We're transitioning from a past type of living to a future. The 1010 event showed this. Uh, we're living through this, through this moment. And so it's right now is the time to get it together. That's the, the theme of this week. You get it together and you give it 100%. Give it everything you got. Think about in your mind, like, you know, we talked today about the labels and, and thinking about yourself. If you did the thing that you think about in your head, what you would do in a given situation, what should you be doing right now? You know, in the story that, that you want to tell your, your grandkids and the story that history tells about you, what would you be doing now as that person you tell yourself you are? And I challenge you to just go do that thing. That's it. Yeah. So if you're doing that thing that you would do, right, because there is what we would do and then there's what we do. And if what you would do is what you do, then you're giving it 100%. If you can look back on the day and say, no, there literally was nothing else I could have done different. And, and not like, let me nitpick and whatever. No, like literally without, you know, because in retrospect, everything you can say, could, minute this, minute there, close the elevator there. It's bullshit. Like, could I, could I have, you know, really made better decisions? Like, uh, not could I have made better decisions, but could I have consciously done better in the moment with the information? Like, and if the answer is no, I'd like, uh, and you, like that, that's it. That's my limit. Then you're giving it a hundred percent. Can you give it a hundred percent forever? I don't know. Like, that's, that's hard, but that's why it's for a hundred days. Our bodies are meant to survive famines Our, mm -hmm. you know, we're meant to withstand hunger for a long time and cold and this and that. Give yourself credit. You're going to last a hundred days, go hard and see what you can do because then you can say that is what I can do. That's, that's literally my best. And don't be afraid to push that. And don't be afraid to say that this is all I got. This is it. There's no more. Um, I want to be comfortable with knowing what that limit is for me. And I want to, I want to push others to do it as well. What is it that you're doing in your life? I mean, you, I, I see a lot of what you're doing. You're doing giveaways. You're doing live shows basically every day. Uh, and you have a green screen behind you. You have a lot of production behind it. Uh, can you give some insight into what you're doing? There's what people think. And then there's what people feel. And, um, we have a lot of common things that we feel together right now on X everywhere in the world. And I'm trying to hit those feelings and respond to them in the best way that I can with the mission of inspiring people, inspiring creativity, self-confidence, imagination, uh, and ultimately so that when you believe anything is possible and you believe that robotics are the future, that your children get into building robots. It's, it's, it's not just telling you robots are, are important. You already know that. It's me showing what the world looks like when the robots do the work for us and we can have fun. What, what drew you to X? I mean, you've only been on X since February. I started um, August or something of last year. What drew you to X? Like Before you had made a decision, like this is the platform I'm going on, you had everything open to you. You could have gone YouTube. You kind of could have gone Twitch. You could have gone on to Instagram or Facebook or any of these other platforms. What was it that you saw where you're like, this is the platform that I'm going to put my effort into? I don't think when I joined X, I, and I'm going to give you the answer of why I'm here now. But when I joined X, I didn't have any of this. I just happened hmm. to join X at the time. Last August, September, I went to San Francisco and I did a business thing with Jason Calacanis. And he was actually my first follower when I opened the account at the time. I didn't use it until like February this year. But yeah, Jason Calacanis was my first follower. He sort of said I should have X. And um, after thinking, Facebook boxes you in socially. Instagram is about pictures. No one gives a crap about each other there. Uh, YouTube is impossible to form community for more than 10 minutes at a time. And it gets completely overrun by uh, childish nonsense. I love YouTube. I learned a lot, a lot there, but in certain yeah. terms of me putting out content, um, LinkedIn, I have no interest in at all. Just, it's just not my vibe. I'm there, but like 500 plus connections, whatever people follow you, but I don't care. Um, the best way that I, uh, 
I find X boxes you in the least and gives you the widest reach that I truly believe is proportional to the quality of what you put in. Hmm. Like when I was getting three views a minute, a, 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 a day, I think that's because the content was worth three views a day. Like, I think over time, this is this platform will best return on my efforts. And it's not about views. If you know I exist, I don't need more views from you. You know I exist. I'm done. My goal is done. It's not how many impressions. It's what is the impression. And the impression is you don't even need to watch any of my videos to know that we're doing this. This is the point of X, right? We can do something so big here. You don't need to go on X for X to have an impact. And I think with the timing of everything um, and the way that X lets you leverage the moment more than any, any other platform, not just more, but the only platform that lets you leverage the moment. Um, it's, I, I think I, I'm, I'm okay with that. And also, I mean, like, uh, I don't need to overthink that. That makes sense to me. Maybe there's more to it, but also it's like saying, okay, well, I have the best party in the, in the, in the neighborhood. There are other good parties too. I don't care. Yeah. My guests are right here. My family is right here. So at the same, like, I, I don't need to try to max out every view on every platform. I'm good. Like we're chilling. That's kind of, that's kind of how I'm thinking now. Like the way, how, why I started with X, it's situation. It just happened to me. But then as, as I saw the, the way that I'm able to connect with people here, sure, there are plenty of parties, but I doesn't mean I need to go part hop from party to party and say, Hey guys, here's me go to my other house. Like, it's just not what I do. I don't need to do that. I'm just going to play music over here really loud. We're going to put the spotlights into the sky. Everybody's going to see them and they're going to come right here. Wait, was there something, anything specific, um, after you got started that really started putting it into your head, like, Oh, this is where I want to be. Like, I mean, you saw the connections that you can build for me. For instance, it was uh, the spaces aspect of it where I'm like, oh, like I'm, I'm, I can't, it's not that I can just post and reach people with a post. Like I can actually get people in a room and have a conversation with people, join other people's conversations, actually get to know and connect with people. Was there something specific that you saw as you started where you're like, oh, this is, this is where I'm at. This is where I want to be. The whole goal the whole time has been to connect with one person and then scale that. Yeah. That's it. So spaces is like, you know, I love spaces. The problem with spaces is um, it's uh, you're going to be talking to a, you're not going to reach the world because of the dynamics. Um, the entire world is more likely to read one of your posts than to be in a space, even though the spaces I find really, really cool. And so I spend a lot of time in spaces. I absolutely love the dynamics there. I met a lot of amazing people. Um, the way to reach beyond that one to 2% of people who are in spaces, probably closer to one, actually, maybe even half a percent of people on X is posted content. That's yeah. the way X works, right? You can connect with people occasionally like, okay, this is, this is what I find with content creators in general, like content creators make content for other content creators and they all know each other and make content for each other and compete for each other's attention. But there is, Literally, the rest of the world, the uh, not the, this 10,000 people, the billion people that you need to be talking to and not these 10,000. The 10,000, these are partners, right? The way to reach this group is not, I don't know. There, that's what I'm trying to do. I don't know. Um, but yeah. X, whether it's a combination, right? Because there's a time for a video. There's a time for a voice note. There's a time for text. There's a time for shaping the text correctly. There's a time to post a blank. There's a time to post a black square, right? There's a way to communicate whatever you want with the right message. And the message is not verbal. It's not folk. It's not a uh, visual. It's emotional. And so whatever it takes in the moment to communicate that emotion. And the thing is, you can never communicate that emotion later. And that's the point of X is that you can capture what the person's feeling, communicate an emotion with that person. And that can never be replicated because that moment is gone. That same post, that same video, those same words mean different things later. And so X lets you really capture that moment. And if you're willing to not lose it, boom, you know, sort of do something with it. And tomorrow is just another moment. Remember? Like a month ago, two months ago, Donald Trump got shot at. Do we talk about that? No, no one gives a crap. That was like almost started World War III. A few days later, we don't care anymore. The moment moves, right? Like really yeah. fast. And so X really lets you 
be in the moment. That's what I what I'm finding in retrospect. I didn't know this. I, I couldn't have known this to start. I didn't use it. How could I know? Yeah, I I remember a few years back I was on X, not like trying to create or anything, but I was just following some accounts, and it it definitely was the place to go for like real time information. If there was something going down, like there's nowhere better. Yeah to find out something and, and get a pulse for things. But that what you said about like creators creating for other creators is really interesting because it I've noticed that it's like, I'm connected to a lot of other creators and you know, I, I have people that aren't creators following me, but it, it is a lot of creators on X that you at least initially get in front of. Um, I'm not sure exactly why that is, but um, why that is, why creators, I think it's some, um, it's, there's a, there's two, uh, so I, I have very strong, I, I have a, an exact opinion. I could be wrong, but I have a very exact opinion of why, why this is, and it formulated what I'm doing. Uh, creators want to feel comfortable around other, we want to feel comfortable, like artists hang out around other artists because it's fun. Yeah. Right. And because you're there, your audience doesn't necessarily want to talk to you. They want to hear from you. Whereas other creators want to talk to you. The other creators want to be heard. The audience wants to be listened to. Sorry, the audience wants to hear you. Creators don't want to hear you. Creators want to be heard. And that's why you end up hearing from so many creators because they want to be heard. The audience doesn't tune in to talk to, to, talk to you. They are tuning into your expertise. They're saying, you know, things we don't, I'm going to shut up and just let you tell me that stuff. And if you can't do that, I'm going to go to somebody who can. And creators aren't like that. Creators are like, Hey, good to see, uh, you know, we're here on the space. This guy is great. We don't even know why. Good to see y'all. Good day. That who can, no fan gives up. Like they don't fan that people who join to learn something don't want to, don't want to hear creators pat each other on the back all day. And that's mm -hmm. what spaces are. Uh, people like if we want to reach the night, the people who are here to learn something, to do something, who look up to people who are, do, who have an hour in their week when they're not working, they're like, listen, maybe I can write a book myself, but I ain't got time for this shit. I want to see some people doing it. I want to be inspired by it right now so that when I have time, I can do it. If in that hour, you just hear people bicker about some garbage in a space, you're just never going to come back to X. So you, what you need to do is like, speak to people, tell them you're doing an excellent job, right? You give people something that, they, they're, they're not, they're better off listening. You know what I mean? Like a lot of time you're going to, you're going to get it there. And it's just like TV, right? Why do you put, why did, why was TV so successful and high production value? Because you can say, okay, I trust you guys yeah. for this 30 minutes to give me something that, you know, I just, I trust you. Okay. I'm going to, I just trust you. And that's because you give them, that's to the word value, right? Whatever that means to you. Yeah. Uh, whether it's, you know, like Mythbusters to me is the ultimate example. I like, I love, I love Mythbusters, right? Uh, we can talk about sitcoms, we can talk about this, but myth, the Mythbusters format, you know, I don't know what it is. I can't describe what it is. I can tell you it's fun and I enjoyed watching it. I'm sure they know the science of why it hit on the moment of busting myths and this and that. And of course, doing it, it matters, but not to me. I don't want to know. And in fact, I don't even want to hear a lot of their conversation. I just want to show up. I want to see you blow the thing up and go home. Like, I don't want to know the other stuff. And so, Creators can still talk to other creators. Just separate that. Like, don't, that's, that shouldn't be the main broadcast. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, what was the question? Because I think I answered it, but. Uh, yeah, why you think it is that. Creators we, talk to other creators. We, yeah. we end up surrounded by a lot of other creators. Yeah. And like, it, it's almost like when I was on X at first, it's like, that's all I saw. It's like all I come across is other creators and all that's following me is other creators. And it's like, cause you're looking for you validation know? from people who say that's great. Where the real validation is a customer giving you a dollar for what you do or a customer showing up and sitting in a seat. Like, when I say customer, I mean a fan who, who gets something from you that they want anybody who gets something from you that they want, that they're willing to give you their time for. That's, that's what I mean. Right. And, um, it's harder to talk to those people. They're much harder to please. Mm -hmm. Creators are much easier to please. You just thank a creator, they'll spend an hour with you. Yeah. Like, you know, and that's fine. That's what we're supposed to do. We're partners. We're in the studio together. That's fine. But there's, we're not going to pay each other's bills. 
There's not enough. We can't simply buy each other's tickets. Yes, we're all at each other's shows, but it's not enough. We cannot just, you know, the label of musicians can't just be the only ones in the stands. We have to ha give it to the fans and the fans want to see it. We just have to talk to them and get the word out. Yeah. And there's also, I mean, to tie into what you're saying, I mean, we're, we all have limited time. If you're surrounded by other creators, I mean, I host spaces and uh, I have people inviting me to their spaces all the time. And it's like, I would love to go to everyone's spaces. I just can't. I can't go to six hours of spaces every day. I just, I just can't do it because I'm busy. I'm Yeah, I'm you're doing, doing the thing that you know? people look up to you for. That's the point. Yeah. But it, it there's another thing that's interesting because like you're saying the audience you know, there, you need people to listen. I struggle with that sometimes because I want to know the thoughts of my audience. Like my whole thing about the podcast is I want to explore perspectives. And then there's people that just listen. And I, I appreciate them deeply. But it's also like I want to know what's in their heads and you just can't. I think you, you know? already do. That's the thing. I think you're already tuned into it. You don't need people repeating at the same time. Mm. Sometimes we'll have a space and people will say the same, like nine people will say the same thing over and over. Yeah. The host already knows what people think. Now give people the solution. That's why we tuned in. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I totally get, listen, I love talking to people. There's nothing more that I want than to spend all day chatting with people. That's way more fun than trying to figure out a way to communicate to everybody like fun. Mm -hmm. But so is sitting around and eating chocolate, right? And I can't just do that all day. Like that, that it's that kind of fun. It's like feeling creative versus actually putting out 10 pieces of material. You can feel creative and not do shit that matters to anybody. And you can feel totally lazy, uncreative, tired, and not even know where you are and still put out material that matters to people. So the feeling and the, and that's the thing. We chase the feeling. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. We just chase the feeling, whether it's eating chocolate or drinking or smoking weed or whatever. We chase the feeling hanging out with each other. It's actually all the same. It's some form of dopamine rush. And it's, it's, if you want to be a professional, you probably can't chase dope all day. Yeah. You have a green screen behind you. I showed you, I got one uh, just mm -hmm. the other day. What has that green screen allowed you to do that you weren't able to before? And, and how are you using oh, it? Oh my God. Listen, I just so, so far, simple things. I'd, I actually like we're doing something today. Uh, I guess this isn't live, but today what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm putting a blue screen on the roof. At the end of the show, the roof is going to open and I'm going to fly away through the roof. So that's going to be me, me kind of showing a little green screen effect that I've never seen live because it's actually going to be live. I'm literally going to be talking to the chat while I fucking fly away through the ceiling. So <laughs> it's going to be great. So that's that's my plan for today. And actually, if you look at last night's stream that I did at like midnight, I didn't even post it. I kind of just wrote testing uh, and then it's up there, but it's on my channel. You can see it toward the end. There's a spot where you can see what the effect is kind of going to look like. I, I was testing it live for the few people that were there. But uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. So the green screen, listen, it lets you do all kinds of fun things. I, I can't say what it like. I can literally go on for hours as far as what you can do. Can yeah. like can come on, bro. It's what, what, like you can do anything like, come on. That's not even a question. Uh, you mentioned a blue screen. I, I'm not familiar. It, what's the difference between a blue screen and a green screen? Is it it's just blue. that they're different colors so you can separate yeah. the two? So let's say I want to wear green clothes, like how a green man has his green. Well, if he had yeah. a green screen in the back, he'd have no face. So he needs to throw in a green and typically you have red, green, and you have magenta sometimes depending on, uh, you know, like if you're really getting crazy, um, but it can be any color. It's just uh, those are the colors that tend to be not used in the scene as much. So if you look around, yeah. there's not much green. I get rid of the green. We're fine. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, and cool. the color also, because it reflects. So if you cut, that, cut out the green, you'd see a little bit of green in my face. And so for effect, maybe you want to use blue because you'd rather not have that because maybe your walls are blue in the studio. You don't want the green leak. So it's purely a technical thing. Yeah. Uh how do you run this? Do you run everything through OBS? Is that where you're putting your background? Uh, OBS in? does the main, I'm kind of, I'm going to be OBS will, yeah, will continue to be the main thing, but there's just a bunch of stuff going into it, like inputs and outputs, a bunch of video yeah. feeds in a bunch of video feeds out the, you know, what people see is the program screen and I just control what goes into it in different ways. I got some buttons, like a little remote with, uh, it's like a stream deck remote, some buttons that just, all the buttons do is they, uh, 
you know, turns scenes on and off. They make something visible or invisible. That's yeah. It. Okay. Uh, when it comes to, so you run everything through OBS and then OBS pushes your main audio through your live stream. What do you use for your live stream? OBS. I push it directly to X. Okay. Okay. Cool. So literally in the settings, you set it like it lets you select. It's uh, RTMP, I believe, is the is a protocol. Uh, Real time movie protocol. I forget what. The, but um, yeah, you just put in your your key. Basically, long, long story short is uh, you go into settings, you put in some stuff, you press go, it goes directly to X. Yeah. I only learned about you working in a recording studio recently. Uh, it was uh, when you did your live stream with Alex, where I learned that. I'm like, I didn't realize that. Um, I have, I consider, I have a little studio at my house. I've never worked in a professional studio, but I've, I started with electronic music production, and I, I just kind of started adding on, bought a synthesizer. I have a, you know, a nice little setup, but it's, it's been interesting because. There were two or three years where I'm like, do I have everything set up right? I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. I've only been in a uh, professional studio once or twice. Um, I'd love to hear about your time in a recording studio. First of all, are you a musician? Like, are you playing an instrument? Or, like, what was your, like, are you a producer? Or, like, where where did that start? And how did... How did it happen that you ended up working in a studio? I I rap and I produce yeah. music. Yeah. Um, I actually used to worry worry about did I have enough equipment and this and that, but none of that matters. Kind of what matters is what does your stuff sound like? You know. Uh, now I spend more time talking about the product than about the tools. Um, probably spent you know I, I wanted to be a you know get into rap when I was like sixteen because you know. You know, you're stupid when you're 16. So then uh, I opened a recording studio with a friend when I was about 21 after university and uh, or 22, whatever the age was. And we had a yeah, we, we recorded some people there. I got nominated for some Toronto Music Award. I performed at the Rogers Center, Canada's biggest venue hmm. for the 100th anniversary of the Grey Cup uh, season opener. Um, so we did some stuff we did, but we didn't make any money because music is like that. You can do cool things. You just make no money at all. It's just yeah. fun. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's fun. You know, I, I do a little bit of a freestyle rapping here and there might, might, might have to do that sometime. Yeah. That's really cool. I, I had no idea you rapped. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did, how did your time in the music studio go? Like you, it sounds like you ran it about six years. Is that right? I'd have to, yeah, no, I mean, looking back specific, so 2010 was when we had the performance. 2012 was when I did the music video with Rob Ford's Body Double. So 2008, we probably opened it. I'm just trying to piece back the timeline. So probably around the, so, so in there. I mean, I, I made music my, since 16, and then we properly opened our own location like at that time. So I'm just trying to figure out when I like, transition to a different building. Um, so 2013 was the last year of the studio. So that would have been whatever year that was. So yeah, twenty. Sorry, not whatever year, but however many years. So twenty thirteen was the last year. What was your, what was your first piece of equipment? Obviously, you probably had a microphone, uh, a input output board. Um, what what were you like? How did it start? What did you buy? When I was first sixteen. Then... I got my parents uh, my to buy me a Behringer B one. It's mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you're into music production, you may have thoughts about Behringer, but it got the job done. You know, it got the, it was very nice, and I had a little tiny preamp that just, you know, had some just on off. And the rest was in, um, man, I don't even remember what it was. It wasn't logic. It wasn't Cubase. It was before that. I forget what the, what the, some kind of, it was like Adobe sound something. I don't even remember, but just yeah. randomly recording into it and doing compression by hand. So literally hand ducking vocals to make sure that the mm. volumes like, man, before you know stuff, how to automate stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, were you you were creating the music too though right like you were writing i'm music? more of a co-writer so like i i've made i i make beats here and there i've uh i spent most of my my time like co-producing co-writing for other people gotcha. and i probably have like a couple dozen songs myself at most i but i would i did a lot more for for other people and that's the point of the studio right if i was like an artist i would go into other studios the studio was so people come in we make beats we 
you know, I, I'll add my piece. But kind of um, like what I found is I could add to what people were doing. Um, like I didn't have a, a character, a narrative, an artist thing to do. I was never trying to be like an artist. Look at me. I'm a rapper. Right. I just happen to enjoy that. But there are other people that there are like musicians trying to make it and whatever. And so I really love producing for them and making their songs. Yeah. Uh, did you know any piano going into it or anything? Piano is typically what I think of when it, when it comes to music production, just because it's the most versatile instrument as far as like you can add any sound to a piano. Yeah, uh, I, can play, I can play piano, uh, violin. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm particularly well theoretically trained, uh, but I've learned to play a lot of things, uh, yeah, just haphazardly. But I can play some really complicated stuff. I, I can play Fantasy Impromptu by heart. Fantasy Impromptu. It's uh, it's uh, just look look up the note the, the sheet music for it. You'll you'll see. Just visually, you'll see. You're not talking about is. Fantasy in D minor by. Uh, just, not... just Google Fantasy Impromptu and look at the first page, and you'll be like, yeah, okay. But basically, like I I don't have any the like basically I just practice something long enough that that I can play it, and I don't particularly care about the theory behind it. Okay. <laughs> Cool, but that's well, a bad, that's a bad approach, you know. That's like that's what I used to do when I actually played piano as a kid because I just enjoyed playing the things for people. Um, but you know, I should have learned more theory. What were your uh, when you got into rap? Who were you interested in? Who were you listening to that that kind of? Uh, Doctor Dre, track? Eminem, Fifty Cent, Exhibit. I actually got to perform with Exhibit on stage at the Sochi oh, Olympics. Nice. Um, I was uh, so random story. Some Russian oligarch built a restaurant on the Sochi Olympics grounds, like uh, unauthorized. Hmm. Uh, like I, how you build a building unauthorized, I don't know, but that's what that's what the story was. And so I was there, and I there was a, an exhibit concert. So I had to you know talk to the guy at the front door. We got in, and you know there's all the people that won gold medals there uh, that that night the IOC is there and i'm like i don't know what i'm doing here and then exhibit and his manager come in and i'm like yo get your walk on cuz that's one of my, that's my favorite song so they come to me cuz i'm the only one that speaks english properly they're like yo who's who's famous here who should we go talk to and then at the end like when they're doing the concert i'm in the front i'm rocking out and then exhibit's like yo stop the concert stop the concert this guy's been singing every word of every song since we started get on stage here with me you want to perform alcoholic with me that's like his big hit song yeah and and he goes, he said, well, we're in Russia. And he goes, nobody in Russia can drink more vodka than I do. And everybody goes insane. And then we perform alcoholic together. I don't drink. So it was kind of funny. But, uh, you know, that, that was dope. So, yeah, love Exhibit. So uh, Eminem, Do Dr. Dre, I would say, is like my, I think my son is named Andre in part because of mm -hmm. Dr. Dre. Um, awesome. Probably my biggest musical hero by far. Like, uh if you want to look at a guy who literally never looked sideways at what anybody thought for a second, never even knew those people existed and just did his thing, that's Dr. Dre. Uh, that's my inspiration. Dr. Dre gives it 100%. Like, yeah. There is a guy who gave it 100%. I didn't know you didn't drink. Uh, has that always been the case? You never drank ever? About 10 years. Like I find I just don't enjoy it. Like It's not like it, I just... I find like I lose the part of me that I, that makes me enjoy life. Hmm. So you were never like a, a drinker, like a big I drinker. Drank, no, listen, I was never like a heavy drinker. There were yeah. times when I'd go out and I would drink and get drunk. Yeah. But there was never a period when I was less like drunk. Like I just, I don't know. It's not, it's to be drinking for a long time. You actually have to be very physical. Like you have to be very physically strong at the moment to handle it. Cause you need to handle the alcohol, right? You can't just drink, pass out. That's not an alcoholic. That's just, that you're just ill to be an alcoholic. You actually have to be strong, hmm. right? And to be, get into drinking, you have to take it. And, and I don't know that I ever had the, the physical, like my stomach had it in it to take it. And I don't know. I just don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy, I don't enjoy losing control uh, in the way that it does. I mean, I, I get it. I, I enjoyed it while I did it, but I also, I just don't enjoy it now. Last time, yeah. like I'll have a glass of wine every two or three years to remind myself. I'll have it and be like, oh, this will be fun. And then I get it. But also like, no, nah, I'm not doing this again. No. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm the opposite. I, I loved drinking and uh, I drank too much. And then I realized I'm like, this is actually preventing me from doing a lot of what I want to do. So I'm going to have to just cut this out yeah. completely. So because it's easy. I mean, it, it's, it's an easy uh, thing to fall into the habit of. So it's always surprising when I find people, I have friends, uh, 
who just don't like it that much. And I've always found that interesting because for me, it's like, it's too easy to like. Mm -hmm. It's Some people don't like coffee. Listen, it's it's like, we're a bag of chemicals, okay? If this chemical doesn't work with your chemistry, it's what it is. It's like, there's no reason you should. There are things that that you don't like that other people like probably, right? Yeah. Exactly. So like, I hate olives. I love olive oil. Hmm. Figure that out, right? Uh, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Um, what's a day in your life look like? <laughs> um, well, I mean, right now we're going 100%. I, I wake yeah. up. I tell people, like, I look back at where we are. I look back at the community of where, where we're going, kind of get a feel for what's going on. And I say, this is, this is what needs to happen. I see the big vision. I see us coming together. Um, and I kind of see the house that we're building, okay? And I'm just trying to make sure that I'm there with the load of bricks in the right place at the right time. So that doesn't, that, that's a you know completely ridiculous way of answering what my day looks like. But I wake up, I literally, I'll make a post, I'll go have breakfast. Uh, and then I'll start building some stuff. I have to, I'll drive my kid to school. So I, I want to make sure that I get Andre to school in the morning and then start doing stuff, whether it's video things or building some robot stuff or working on a program. Uh, like if there's, uh, let's say we're on month three of a program we just started, I'd be working on the third month of that program. Um, but something to do with either building a robot directly or something to tell people about that robot. It's very straightforward. So like right now, before the interview, I w- I'm setting up the studio right now. I took a picture of the stuff that I'm giving away live. I'm actually giving away a lot of video equipment today on stream. So the stuff mm-hmm. that got me here, I'm going to give away today because I'm moving to a new spot and I want I want to have people get into it. So right before we got on, I spent 30 minutes taking this picture, sent it out. We're going to do this interview. Uh, it's going to be done. I have a call uh, regarding, you know, some strategic stuff. And then another call on branding. These are new people I'm bringing on board. This is totally new. Uh, you, but usually I would spend that time um, to be, okay, here's the thing. It's really hard to say because my day is really in response to what's going on. There's the big goal. We're going to, we're making the sticker. We're going to Texas with it when it's done. We're giving things away every day. So I'm doing a 6 p.m. stream. I'm teaching kids. So some days I'm in at 4, uh, 3.30 or 3.45 in the school. So I have to get back in time for that. Those are the things that are happening no matter what, right? The rest is what can I do today to maximize today's opportunity to tell people about building robots, to show how it can be done, um, and to get us closer together in Texas. That's it. And I literally, am, I think for like 20 seconds, what is the best thing that I can do right now? And then I just do that thing because it really, and this is what X is about. This is what makes X different from every other thing, way of communicating is that you can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow with certainty. You can plan for it, but things will change and you're going to change it anyway. And that's what I try to do is I have a plan, but things change like the day to day really changes. And so you have to respond. And so I'm ready to respond. If that means I have to drive somewhere right now, if that means I have to call someone right now, make a certain video, a certain post, like I'll give you, I want to give a straight up example. Like the poker game with Alex Finn on Friday. Okay. I played a game with Alex and that was really fun. But the way that it came is I didn't plan to do that ever. On Thursday, he had a stream at 4 p.m. I jumped in at 4.57 just because I saw it in the corner. It was like pink. So I clicked it, and then he's talking, and I'm like, yo, Alex, remember 1-2? Let's play 1-2. He's like, yeah, okay. uh, He reads the comment. He's like, 1-2, okay. No, nothing happens. Then I, then I post up another comment that, that says, uh, show up at 6 p.m. This is the stakes. Show up here with a handshake thing. And randomly, he puts it up on the stream and starts giving the speech about how tomorrow will be a crazy day. And that was random. The comment happened to be there. He didn't even say yes to the game, it's just random. So I took a screenshot, I put it up and I said, I challenged Alex Finn to a poker game because on the visual, that's what it is. And then I made the video with this poster. And I was like, Alex, if you show up in four hours or six hours, we're doing this. And then I got some people at the Finn fam to send it in there. And three hours later, I get a message. He says, I'm in. So there's no way to do that without me making this poster. No. That wouldn't happen because that means I'm serious. Um, and that wouldn't happen if I didn't accidentally go into that game and accidentally post that message, which he accidentally left on the screen to give me that opportunity. And so X creates 
unlimited such opportunities every day. Unlimited. There are 50 things I can respond to right now with something like that. And the question is, what are you going to do with those opportunities? Yeah. Where does your energy come from, man? Because you are one of the most high energy people <laughs> I know. And I'm. are you fueled by coffee? Do you wake up with this much energy or like what's your diet like? It's not like sleep. Oh, it's, it's most so the most important ingredients are what you don't put in. If you avoid certain things. OK, this is the real trick. Don't eat meat with carbs. Hmm. If you're ever tired after a meal, you're doing it wrong. I have not been tired after a meal in over 15 years because I did one thing. If you have chicken and rice, take the rice away, eat the chicken. An hour later, eat the rice. You will <laughs> never be tired after. There, you know, you will literally never. Okay, I'm telling you. You know how sometimes you eat and you're like, I want to sit down. I have not had that in 15 years with that one change. And I'm not a health dietitian, whatever. I'm just saying this is a non-invasive thing you can try. Try it for a day. You don't want to do it. Go back to eating whatever way. I don't care. But I'm telling you 100%, if there is one thing that gives me energy, it's that. Coffee or not, I'll have the same. I, you know, a coffee will perk anybody up. Sure. Uh, whatever. Uh, that's it's, it's a stimulant. But people can have coffee and not be energetic. So I honestly believe it's one thing. It's not eating carbs with meat. Because before I did that, I would always feel sluggish after a meal. And mm. I would always have to consider, okay, well, I'm going to eat, then I'm going to have to sit. None. No, literally, I can eat, get up, and run. Right? Sit down again, eat, and, like, not feel it there. It's just there. It, I don't, there's no whatever, there's no, it's like I didn't eat, I just have the energy back. Mm. So ever since I realized you could do that, that's all I did because then I would be stupid to make myself tired because I know if I do that, I get tired. And it took like five years to, to actually separate the stuff. It's, it's like I knew five years before I did it. But then yeah. day by day, I would slowly like, okay, no, I really like this burger. And then, okay, I'll eat it, just the burger, fuck it. But eventually when I, now if I ever go back to, to like, if I just take this amazing chicken, amazing rice, eat them together, and I, and I don't feel good. I will never, I, and you know, I'll do that once a year just to test that, that, that it's still the case. And I'm like, never doing that shit again. Mm. And I'm literally like, there's no, there's no gratitude. There's no amazing thing that like drives me. It's literally just not eating meat and carbs together. Like I've always been driven to do things, but I haven't had this energy. And honestly, like don't eat meat and carbs together. Like it, it's not... Yeah, it's not some religious thing. It's not some drug thing. It's don't eat meat and carbs together. <laughs> do you, as stupid as it sounds. Do you avoid junk food completely? Do you eat junk food? Oh, at yeah, all? I, eat, I eat absolutely. I would say by, by most standards, I eat incredible. I eat, uh, you know, 100% wild or organic, you know, beef, chicken, fish, rice. Like, I don't even eat bread, like in the sense of pro even made of rice. I literally just eat the raw food the food mm. itself, not raw, but like the food food. And that's it. Like, oh, and I'll eat ice cream. Okay. I have a so delicious ice cream, cashew based, and okay. I will eat half a kilogram a day. Okay. And I'm, I'm curious about this. Do you not eat dairy then? I don't No, I can't eat wheat, potato, tomato, dairy, and corn because they'll absolutely destroy my life. Uh, is that like an audio autoimmune thing? I, it's autoimmune. Yeah. It basically just creates inflammation. I just get really tired, basically. Like, I don't like, uh, it's not like anaphylactic or, or whatever, or like die or whatever. I just get really tired. I'm just barely getting into the land of uh, no dairy because I, uh, I, I've choked a few times. Oh, wow. um, and it, it turns out that I have a condition called eosinophilic esophagitis, which is an autoimmune oh, wow. thing. And it's like your eosinophils start building up in your esophagus. And uh, it's caused by the foods that you're eating, like dairy is a big one. So I've been cutting out dairy, eating less wheat, stuff like that. So I'm feeling better because of it. Um, but I mean, cheese tastes amazing. So and it's un it's it takes time. everywhere. It, takes time. it is everywhere. Like, but you only know once you eliminate everything that you shouldn't eat for a few days, then you have the lighthouse for where you're trying to get. Until yeah. then, you don't really know. Then you'll own that. So the way to get there. I did all kinds of stuff. I spent five or six years trying to figure out, like I had rheumatoid arthritis, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. There is a type of testing called electrodermal testing. It costs about a hundred bucks. Almost every city has a clinic. You hold an electrode, 
And within 30 minutes, they're going to print out a list of foods that you shouldn't, shouldn't eat and what they do to you. And it is so accurate for me and everyone I've ever sent there that you literally just look at the red ones, stop eating the red ones. You look at the yellow ones, eat those a couple times a week, green ones, eat all the time. And that's it. And it's like, it's non-invasive. I don't, whatever clinic you go to in Toronto, there's one called Red Paw. They're, they're everywhere. And it's, it's like incredibly popular in Germany, but here we happen to not promote things that, that are good for you a lot. Um, <laughs> so I highly recommend if anybody has problems with any food, whatever the electrodermal testing clinic is in your area, try it. It's non-invasive in the sense of like, there's no needle, there's no in thing in your body. All you have to do to know if it works is just stop eating those foods for like a day. And that's it. If you don't like it, just, just ignore what I said. But, I, but I'm, as far as like everything in my life changed, from going to that to that and understanding what I shouldn't eat and then not and then ultimately the carbs and the meat together was the final nail. So the electrodermal testing you're you're just holding something that's reading the electricity. So, okay, they put body. an electrode in one hand and then they basically touch the other hand. And something to do with the way the electricity passes through your body, they figured out can tell you what you should and shouldn't eat. I don't know how it works. They test for other things too. They test for parasites that test for a million different conditions. Like this is, this is real science. Like this is crazy yeah. stuff. And the results are, as far as you need to know, a list. Here are things that, and it's really easy to test. Eat one of the red ones. Feel bad immediately. Easy to test. <laughs> Eat the green ones. Keep feeling good. But they're easy. not exposing you to these things. No, in that's the, the thing. You don't have to eat it. And you, they literally 300 foods that you can get a result on. And in my personal experience, it's like, it's, you know, before the carbs and meat, that was the final, like I actually had to eliminate the ones I couldn't eat altogether. Yeah. Right. Like for example, wheat, I can't even eat that separately. Right. You know what I mean? So first you got to eliminate things in your body. And a lot of people don't have that. Like if you can just to tolerate everything, that's fine. You just need to separate the carbs and meat. And this isn't advice. Like I'm, I'm a nutritionist and this and that. I'm just, that this is all to the question of where I get my energy. Yeah. It's from eating not eating carbs and meat. That's it. And in my case specifically, I know I can't eat certain things because I get inflammation. So just not eating those, but that's everybody. Well, I mean the, the idea of people being able to tolerate everything. I wonder about that sometimes because I, I, I often, I sometimes wonder if we, cause I know I've been in this state in my own life where it's like you're gaining weight and you just don't realize how bad you feel. Sometimes mostly numb. Yeah, Most yeah. people are numb and it's like, it's considered abnormal when you actually feel something and yeah. which is crazy. It's like, if you feel that the chemical is killing you, it's called sensitive. No, it's you're numb. Yeah. Just don't be numb. When did this, uh, when did your diet start changing? When I, when it had to, when How if I you? ate the wrong foods, I couldn't walk. <laughs> when, when did that start? Um, so at around age 19, uh, mm. was the first like symptoms where I had iritis inflammation of the iris, like who gets, who strains an eye muscle, right? Um, and then a couple of years within a year or so I had like, uh, yeah, like joints were swelling up and this and that, but it's whole body inflammation. So what that means is if you have stress somewhere, like, let's say you, I play basketball and I hit my heel. Well, that thing is going to be swollen now for two years yeah. <laughs> because I'm not going to let it heal because of the inflammation. And as soon as it goes away, you're back to being fine. Gotcha. Um, any thoughts on why you weren't having issues before or were you just numb to it? Oh, this is, I mean, things change genetically. Like from what I understand, uh, there's a marker called HLA-B27, which uh, leads you to be, to have more likely to develop this at the age that I did as opposed to earlier or later. Like there's a million things with where our bodies develop, what they do and they don't. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's say, why, why is my color the way that it is? It's just, like, why is my hair brown? Why is my, you know, my eye green? Why is my, you know, why are my lips this color? It's just the, the way that I, the way that science works. There's probably some reason. I personally don't care. All yeah. I need to know is like, what do I need to do to feel the way I know? Like, now that it's all passed, I'm like, this is the lighthouse. I know how I can feel. If I don't feel that, I did something wrong. And it's usually I ate something wrong, which no longer happens. So now that it's really fine tuned, if something goes off. I can tell, okay, it was this. Yeah. I ate this today. It was different than before. And I know that's the reaction. And it's obvious. Yeah. It's, it's just interesting how sometimes we can, we can tolerate 
something for years and then one day it's like your body's just like no can't do it anymore. i'm gonna show you i'm, done. I'm gonna show you uh, so i have a picture that i show people for your body can get used to anything um uh yes your body can get used to anything but there is a difference between surviving and thriving and i'm going to show you what, what i mean by that so do you see that this fish has a ring around it this fish's body adjusted to it, hmm. but this fish yeah. is not developing to its full potential. It's highly restricted. It will never be what it can be so long as it's restricted by something. And of course it, it lives fine. It's going to grow up. It's going to have kids, but that fish will never live the best that it can until it removes that. And so I found when I finally removed that things opened in, in a way that you, you don't expect, you don't know can open. When, so when you're, diet started changing when you actually started taking everything that just wasn't good for your body away what was your energy like before and what was your energy like after the energy before was like this highly extreme i can get listen i i am i can get myself to move mm -hmm. but it felt like a lot of work like when i felt light that felt like okay something is like unusually good right it just it felt like a lot more work yeah. Now moving doesn't feel like work, even if I'm tired. You know what I mean? Like I can last night, 1 a.m. And you see me on the stream. I'm, I'm lugging this this stove around here. I just I do not feel tired. I feel I feel am I physically awake or not? But there is no difference. And I feel sometimes that my muscles can get fatigued from just, you know, you push things long enough. The muscles will eventually yeah. start. to. But I don't feel any sort of. Uh, like. I don't know. I, I'm always, I feel like I'm hanging like this by a string, no matter where I go. Like I'm just going to stay upright. It doesn't matter. Was waking up different? Like, were you tired when you woke up before? And are you energetic as soon as you wake up? It was more going to bed earlier. Like I would just get tired by like nine, 10. And it was like, okay, I have to like sit down. I have to, I, I, can't, I can't keep doing this. Like I literally, if I don't sit down, like my, my back is seized up already. Like I, I can't continue. Mm. And so, yeah, it's just a physical limitation. It's just, I would just get tired faster. And therefore, like, I never had a hard time waking up. Just yeah. with X, do you feel like it's just way better for experimenting? I I felt, I feel like that. Yes. Like I'm, I'm doing my consistent yeah. thing. The podcast is consistent, but then I get to throw out just thoughts or ideas and I, I get to play with spaces and try new concepts and how oh, that didn't work. This Absolutely. works. And people are forgiving. They're not like, oh, you're not you're giving me something I don't like, and I'm going to unfollow you because you're trying something new. That's absolutely it. And I find there's two reasons. One is people are forgiving, but two is people forget. So, you know, every month or so you got Doge designer throws up something from Elon. The dislike button is going to be added. The like counter is going away. They just announce it. Yeah. And then it goes away and nobody cares. They all just forget. And so that's what X because of the volume, because of the, Here's what's happening today. We no longer care about the past, even if you just were just full of shit. We just don't care. We're just moving forward. And so X kind of just lets you bullshit at your own pace. Now, granted, if you don't bullshit, like if you're honest the whole way and with good intentions, which is what I'm trying to do, it's even better. But X does kind of let you experiment and do whatever you want because it's about today. You can come up with some idea that in retrospect is like, oh, that's some bullshit. But in the moment, I felt like trying it. And it was worth a try and, and whatever. And that's, that's kind of the cool thing about X is that your impression is your last transaction. Hmm. And that's, that, that is something that I enjoy about it. It is. That's what, that's what makes it kind of a startup environment. I've always enjoyed the startup environment, doing things. All of life is actually a startup. Like I think it's kind of um, deceptive to tell ourselves that anything is like set or fixed. And now you're comfortable, you know, in Russia, in Russian, there is no word for safety. Hmm. The word for safety is bezapasnost, which is dangerlessness. There is no word for a, uh, a, 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 a guaranteed lack of harm. There, there is no word for it, right? Dangerlessness is the closest that you get to it. But you know what I mean? That's not the same as safety. Yeah. So I don't believe in the concept of safety. I, don't, I think at any point, you could, literally anything can happen. I mean, yeah, there, that's a good point. Like... You can be in your house where most people consider themselves safe, but you're not safe from 
earthquakes. You're not safe from a bunch of different things that can happen. A fire can start in your house. Anything. Anything you can lose your job today for no yeah. reason. You can, the electricity could go out, blah, blah, blah. Listen, we could, who cares, right? What are you going to do? Like, what would you do with this time? Because it, 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 it all started like some, the time is finite, right? Not to be dramatic, but however you end it, that's how you end it. But in that time, what you do is what counts. And so all that stuff is nice, but really, like, what are we going to do right now? And that's why, like, I just want to, being able to focus on what we're doing today and now is the most important thing for me. What what have been some of the most challenging things for you over the years? Like some things that have really tested your resilience, if you want to share. Um, I don't know. Um... I don't think I've ever felt less driven. So in the sense of testing my resilience, but maybe in, in terms of challenging, like the thing that was the hardest to learn is to look at what you say, honestly. And, and I've done that actually by posting more online because in the process of speaking and posting online, it lets me filter my own bullshit in that I have lots of thoughts, but when you try to and go, go to say them, you realize a lot of them shouldn't be said. And that lets you much more quickly evolve your own set, your own thinking and being able to look at what I do honestly and say, okay, I can see that. No, that sucks. It doesn't matter. It, like not looking at it. Like it's you looking at like the thing that you make without the, without the association of you having made it. That's really hard. It's like listening to yourself on a, on a recording and trying to honestly edit it. It's really difficult. Um, that's the hardest part. That's that, that's been the biggest challenge is, seeing what other people see and not what I see. Although I've, I also think I'm like, I have, I have that skill, but it's also the hardest thing to do. Interesting. Um, when it comes to motivation, you have this really big goal of 10 million robots being built by children or 10 million children building robots that can, it seems like something that could be discouraging because it takes so long. How do you, maintain short-term motivation while I never even consider. So that's a question that I never even considered. Like you're <laughs> saying, what if it doesn't work? I literally have never had that thought. It's no, not, no a not what if it doesn't work, but like, <laughs> obviously working toward 10 million takes a long time. Yeah. And like the difference between 1000 and 1100 is, I think these, these are questions I don't ask. These are questions I don't ask. These are questions that keep you from doing things. There are things you can find to keep doing things. And there are things you can ask that will do nothing but create obstacles. There's no point in answering that question, except I see the goal. I see it. I find it's the label question. I find it a dangerous question to answer in that it will affect what I do. Um, I don't like my motivation hasn't changed. Okay, this is really it. When I was five, I wanted to be a garbage man. I don't like cleaning things like rubbing dirt off things, but I really enjoy tidying them. I want to clean the mess. Mm. And so this is my, this is the first step in me cleaning up the world. I want to make the entire world. I want to be the world's garbage man. And this is the first step. It, I can't do it alone. This is, it's a much bigger mission than a per person, but between the robots that I'm building and the kids that are then going to build them, one of the first important things in the world is going to be to clean up the whole world of all the garbage that shouldn't be where it is. I don't talk about this as much, but the, the goal is really like the ch 10 million children is 10 years. My life is not going to be, it's going to be more than 10 years. And my goal is to clean up all of the garbage in the entire world. <laughs> but that I don't talk about yet as much because there are steps to it. If I start to talk about that, we're going to miss the goals that I want you to focus on right now, which is come see me make a sticker. Come help me make more kids learn robots. And in the process, you're going to see me build these other things. And yeah, before 10 years is up, believe me, we're going to get there. Well, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at is uh, not like how do you – it's how do you maintain that overarching goal while making progress that might not be too visible in the short term? Right. Like Because if you, if you go from 1,000 to 1,001 children with robots – as far as what that is relative to 10 million, it's the same number, essentially. How do you kind of maintain yeah. that focus while, like, how do you? Growth is logarithmic. There's only like five steps. Hmm. The first step is a thousand. The next step is 10. The next step is a million. The next step is 10. It's 10 million. The growth is not linear. 
Going from zero to 100 is as hard as going from a million to, to, to 10 million. Going from zero to 1,000 is as, is as hard as going from that. So th there are not a million steps. There's only about five steps. Okay. Um, it's, let's say you're climbing a mountain or hiking and you know where you're going. Do you worry about whether each turn gets you closer? No, because you know the path. You are certain of the path. You know where the mountaintop is. And then you know that if you start going far enough down, you'll feel it and you'll turn back. You just, you're not going to keep going down. You're not, you're not a dumbass. You're not going to dive into the ocean. The mountain is there. There are trees here. Okay, I'll find a way around them. I just know where the mountain is. I trust that I can go long enough around all these things. It doesn't matter where they come up. And like, just trust yourself, right? Trust yourself to not kill yourself in the process, right? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if, if I start to make a decision, if I start to do a thing that is like, okay, well, this doesn't help anything I'm doing, I just will stop doing that thing. Usually I'll stop it in the thinking process. Gotcha. And, and it's really different. Look, like this is not what they will teach you in any thing, react to the thing of the day. But I believe that's what lets, that's what I can do on X that is different from everybody. And it could fail. And in a year I might be like, well, this in the moment thinking didn't get me anywhere. Let's make a big business plan and go raise a million dollars in San Francisco and make a company an LLC and go to this rope. Like, you know what I mean? Like that, that's all a path, but no one cares about that path. I want to do something that people are going to remember and be inspired by. And I, everything I look, I do, I'm like, okay, if I look back on that, will that be like, yo, that was dope. If the answer is yes, I'm kind of okay with that. So it's, like, it's a lot simpler. Like uh, my, my thinking process is really like really straightforward. Yeah. Would you say that your plan is a lot of unknown? Like when you look at your plan, is it like you don't have a detailed plan of like this step, this step, this step. It's like we need to do these big steps to get there. But all the details around that aren't necessarily known. I know the entire plan, but it also changes entirely to the end every couple of days. Hmm. Literally, I have a plan to the end. But given on what happens in, in a couple of days, within each day, I literally have to adjust the entire plan. That's interesting. You, uh, Where do you draw or do you draw any inspiration from others? Every single person that I see, every single person, particularly people that make content, and by content, I know I use that word, but anybody that puts messages out to the world, they do that because they have something really important that they need to tell people. It's often obfuscated by the other hundred things they say in the process, but everybody has one or two things that are brilliant, like life changing. And I just listen to everybody long enough to, to suss that thing out because they, they every, every, everybody knows something like um, something genius and then try to say, okay, that's what you really know. And then do that with 500 people. And then, that's, that's me. Like, I'm just some of people I know. When I look at you, if I were to not know anything about you, just know that you're somebody trying to get to 10 million children building robots, I would think you're a specialist. But after knowing you, I think you're a generalist with very focused goals. Yeah. How do you, because I'm a generalist, but one of the problems I, I have as a generalist is... I'm interested in so much, and this comes back to the no problem. Uh, it's, I want to do everything, but it's, you don't have time, you have limited time, and there's a problem of you pick up things, you get pretty good at it, but you don't get quite there enough to make money, or you don't get quite there to make it into a career or make it into something more than a hobby. How do you focus and get something to be you're as good as a specialist without being a specialist. How, how do you get there? One thing at a time. Um, it's, it's the project. It's by focusing on the thing that gets the project. You know, I said, like, if you care about the house, you'll, you'll, carry, you'll be really strong because you carry enough bricks. If you just focus on your project, eventually you'll put enough time into it to be good at whatever it is, good enough, like good enough. It's not good. There's listen for everything that I do. There's someone better than me, but I'm not trying to beat those people at anything. I'm competing with myself. Hmm. So, um, the specialist and the generalist, I see those are labels. I never even can I don't, I don't look at it like that. I'm, I'm like, 
what did I do today? Like read the weekly post. That is a list of what I did. If you want to put a label on that, say content creator, teacher, I, that doesn't change what I do. In fact, that can only limit it. Um, so, um, just not being afraid to try new things and that most things are really easy to learn 80% of the way there within a day. Uh, <laughs> like you literally can learn most things in a day, hmm. not enough to be a professional, but enough to get the job done to communicate whatever you're doing. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm also 37 years old, right? Like I've spent 25 years trying different stuff. I should know something. I should have asked this question earlier, but what is robotics actually? Because uh, uh, we have this typical image of, uh, you know, an upstanding, an upright standing robot that's humanoid like and that's what I think most people kind of think of as robotics, but it's a much bigger field than that. Can you kind of dive into that? The word robot comes from the Eastern European word robota, which in, in many Eastern European languages means either work or hard work. A robot is a machine that does your work. That's all to me. I don't care what form it is, how many arms it has, whatever. And if it has eyes or not, is it a machine that is not human? And that's doing my work. That's a robot. Hmm. Is a uh, is a camera a robot? Would you say a camera is a robot? I mean, this is the label thing. It's like, does it matter? A camera can put my face on your screen. I, if we spend time trying to label it, we don't make another post. That's how I look at it. I don't think. I think the answer is, it does. It literally doesn't matter. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, what's in store what's what's coming up for you like what do you have going on over the next couple weeks months years like what do you oh man you're, you're asking too many questions that's uh <laughs> <laughs> today we're gonna arm wrestle a robot maybe tomorrow today i'm doing a crazy thing at the studio and then i'm, I'm moving into the void the next studio is gonna be uh floor ceiling and wall different green screens we're gonna do things never seen before that's what i'm doing right now this Saturday, I'm making a 20-foot prototype sticker downtown Toronto. I mean, yeah, dude, like, the, I, the, you're asking really great questions, I think, as an interviewer. But as, a, as somebody who is trying not to box himself in, you're asking yeah. questions that just basically all they will do is, like, list things that I need to do, which I will never do because that's not how I work. I have lists, but the things that need to be done are the two things at the bottom. And everything else will change tomorrow anyway. Some of them will stay. Some of them will be rearranged. So the answer is I actually don't know. Like, I do know, but I don't know. We're going to teach 10 million kids to build robots. We're going to clean up the world's garbage. We're going to make this big sticker, drive it in January there. I don't, I don't know. Everything else is ambiguous and bullshit, right? Like, those are the specific things I'm going to do. Everything else that is more ambiguous than that is fake and, re and, and doesn't exist. It's just... it's. You know, it's, it's like that. So I look at things that I can do and, and I do this on purpose. Like I get the conversation. I get that. Well, how do you plan to change? I'm like, okay, where is the car? Where is the door that I can open so I can sit down, press the gas pedal and go somewhere? Because literally everything else is literal bullshit. In my opinion, it's stuff that keeps you from doing the thing as you continuously try to label the thing you're doing. That's my honest answer is like, that's the but you'll answer me you can ask me this in 10 minutes and i might have a much smarter answer hmm. <laughs> so i don't know if somebody is uh your focus is on children for actually teaching but if somebody's in their 30s someone our age who has never done robotics how do you recommend they get into it if they want to just learn if they want well, like to i, said, I got into it in my 30s uh, um, or how, yeah, how do you get into it? Like, well, I wanted to make a button that sits on my yeah, desk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that it would. It starts with the project. Find a thing that you want to exist. Two weeks ago, live on stream, I made a follower counter. That's that's where is it? it sits on my desk and shows me how many followers I have. Make that because that's cool, right? You can show your friends. Hey, this is how many followers I have. Follow me. You'll see this go up. That's cool. The coolness of it will get you to make that. It's going to take you three days. You'll make it. What about, uh, I mean, are there materials you should start kind of collecting or, or start? You're working backwards. You don't even know what you want to build yet. You're going to like collecting materials, mm -hmm. figure out what you want to build. And most of the time you already have the stuff. 
And if you're missing something, go on Amazon and buy it. But you can't, what, why bother? It's like building this. And that's where it goes back to, you know, thinking I had things missing in the studio. Until you know what you're making, there's literally no point in buying anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I mean, we both had that music production background. And that's a big thing that boxes in. You can get boxed in with music by having too much. You don't even know what you don't want to. You don't even know what you use. You're just collecting like music producers. Get I do that. I did it. that, dude. Exactly. Yeah. I just collected paintbrushes. like was, crazy. With no sense of what I'm painting at all. Just yeah. like collecting. I, and I'm so guilty of that. I, I'm like a gearhead, right? So I love having more lights and more cameras and it's that even if I'm not going to use them, I got one sitting right here. So this robot that I built, right? I did this just for fun. Like, you know, we got this camera on a robot. It's just sitting here. I'm not even doing anything with it. I just love this kind of stuff, right? So it's going to get activated this week. I'm going to have people be able to drive around the studio and actually during the live stream have a robot driving around that they can look in different parts of the studio. Um, anyway, yeah, like uh, if you just collect gear for the sake of gear, yeah, you'll just have gear. But if you're trying to paint, then you'll actually find, I don't need a brush. Maybe I can grab the edge of a cell phone and dip it into the paint and paint. Like you'll find, you know, the solutions aren't the gear. The solutions are whatever produces the effect. And I'm not like a super artist. Listen, I'm like, I'm thinking out loud. I, I, I always treat this as highly opinionated, largely uneducated <laughs> opinions. Well, you're, I always enjoy hearing your opinion, talking to you. Like you, you have such an interesting mind. I, I truly enjoy talking to you. Is there anything that you do every single day? Like, like an actual thing? Like, do you read every day? Do you, is there anything that you do every single day or that you try to do every day? I mean, I, I'll, no. Hmm. It, do you feel I have like consistent, I have things to avoid. Like I don't need to eat at a certain time, but yeah. I know to separate the carbs, right? There's, there's nothing time-based right? There's only rules for don't do this now. Like if I'm about to do something, should I do it or should I not? If I shouldn't, done. Decision's done. I don't need to think of when to do it. I just shouldn't do it right now. So, and, and it seems to work. And I, and with the right nutrition, I find that as long as I, you know, my body tells me when I'm hungry, I'll go eat. Everything else doesn't matter. When it happens, everything feels exactly the same, whether it's 1 a.m. or 1 p.m. It like actually all is exactly the same as long as I'm extremely stable in that sense. Do you have your next day planned out at all? So this is where like, there's the plan. So like I have a spreadsheet, for example, let's say this hundred days thing that I'm doing. So I have a spreadsheet on this week. I want to do this this week. I want to do this, but then last week things happened and I completely rewrote it. Um, so for example, yesterday I wanted to do arm wrestling with robots here and I wrote it down, but there were more important things to do. As a, so there's like a goal. Okay. Every day has a couple of goals that must happen at all costs, even if nothing else gets done and every, nobody else is happy. This gets done no matter what. There's one or two things. That's the six o'clock show. And there's a couple little other things. Nothing else actually, everything else is in flux. So there is a plan and there is not. So there, there are, the plan is more goal oriented and there are times to it. And it is specific, but it changes every day. So you kind of you kind of asked that before, I think, right? Yeah. So the, the, I do have a plan, but it changes every day. And it's not a daily plan. It's a set of goals. And sometimes the goals have to come faster. And sometimes you have to add goals before. And that's the why I like working with X is that it, it works with that mentality. I couldn't do this with other jobs, platforms, situations. This is a rare situation where you really are floating in the moment and you're Kind of, you know where you're going, but you're responding to the waves as well. And it's set up that way on purpose. Yeah. I like that. I, and I agree. I think if you were on YouTube or something, it just seems like you'd get boxed into just teaching robotics or, or something. It'd be like people go there to see you do a specific thing every time versus yep. like X. It's like, what's Vladimir doing today? You know, well, that's exactly you said it. You said it right there. YouTube is about what did this guy make? Uh, what did, what, you know, what is it, not about the people. YouTube is about content. Yeah. X is about people. On X, people follow you, not your content. Your content is actually irrelevant. Like, people follow you. 
the memes that go viral from day to day, if you happen to have a viral meme someday, fine. But those don't go, nobody follows you for that. Yeah. Right. You notice you can have 5 million views on a meme. Nobody follows because that's not, that's not what people, that's not how it works. Those are, it's, it's the bird app. Okay. This is still the bird app. Lots of birds. They're all chirping. Sometimes you'll hear a really loud chirp, but until you hear it several times, you're not going to start to turn toward that chirp. And that's following you versus your content. You might hear something loud, but you're not going to turn your head there. You're going to turn your head there when you hear it over and over and it's what you like. It doesn't have to be the loudest. Yeah. And that's, that's what X is, is like you repeat, repeat, repeat. And then people hear that chirping and they're like, that's cool. And slowly through the noise, they turn to you and now they're following you because birds only can only look in one direction. And yeah. so that's the mentality. That, that's kind of the approach that I'm having to this whole thing. It's not, and the timeline is like that, right? The timeline doesn't let you see multiple things. You kind of see a thing, that thing better be the thing that hits right now or scroll past. And so you kind of have to work with that dynamic. And I actually, I didn't like it as much at first because I thought it would be cool to just have a volume of all my crap that I dumped in here and go look at my page. But then I realized like, if you actually do that, it's a little bit asocial. X is designed with this way that they present information to not be an encyclopedia. Hmm. It's meant to be a living thing. And so as I'm more tuning into that, I'm not using it as a repository for information. I'm not using it as the, as, as the thing to, to write my pick. It's a walkie talkie. That's what it is. That's what X is. It's a walkie talkie that lets you broadcast your stuff out to people who care, who you make care for a second while you do a thing they care. And then they stop caring. Yeah. That's how I'm, that's my approach right now is I'm literally using it as a walkie talkie and being like, okay, if I say this and people, all, and, and now with a few followers, right? Like I can see, I can put something out and like 50, you know, like 12 likes in a second. So clearly people have notifications on, I want to not abuse that. The fact that people are looking at me while I'm chirping, that's the thinking I'm thinking out loud, but that's sort of where my thinking is with X and really not using it as a content repository. It's not about that. It's about you can, what's the best thing I can give you? You're looking at me. What's the best thing I can give you right now, given what you already know about me to move the story forward. Yeah. There's a certain amount of, for me, it feels like responsibility or even I get a little, I don't want to say anxiety because it's not anxiety. Absolutely. Dude, I get the but, same thing. I'm like, it's oh, like, I'm trying to get this out, trying to get it. Yeah. But it, with, uh, with notifications, like you're saying, cause it's like, if somebody has a notifications on, I almost feel like it, I almost don't want people to have their notifications on. I because, have the same thought. Because and I so want my, to just be free to do whatever the hell I yes, want, yeah, you know? Yeah. And like, I don't want people to get sick of like, oh, I have notifications on because I love yeah. your spaces. And now you can't repost a friend's AI post because yeah, you don't get the yeah. friend. Yeah. Um, the way I got around that is I'm thinking, uh, I don't care. Um, I, I, I first thought the same thing last week. And then I was like, okay, listen, this is what I'm going to do. They have their notifications on. They're getting likes from other people anyway. Their phone is going off all day anyway. Yeah. I'll post, even if I post 10 times a day, they're probably getting 200 notifications. So my spam may not be that bad. And I don't spam. Like I'll actually post only three or four times a day. Yeah. But the day, like there might be one or two days when I post 10 times because that's, it requires, there's 10 things to respond to. It's just what it is. And I don't see evidence yet that people are turning off the notifications. I'm still like, it doesn't mean spam. Like if I spam, people are going to be turned off, turn it yeah. off. They will, because I'm still, it's all within the brand. And I'm literally like, if I was this person and I was receiving these messages, would I turn them off? And I don't necessarily need them to keep the notifications on. This is not about that. My campaign is 6 PM Eastern every day on my channel. I don't care if you watch it on a friend's TV. I care. You know, we exist. I don't even care if you show up every day, every day at 6 PM Eastern, you're going to think about hundred days. You, that's it for these hundred X 6 PM Eastern. You think about us 6 PM Eastern. You think about us nothing else counts. Yeah. If I can do that for a hundred days, I can put whatever message I want in there. When I, I love what you pointed out about the viral post, because I've seen this from people. It's like, you see somebody and they, you see a post that has a hundred thousand, 200,000 impressions and you know, thousands of likes. And then you go to their profile and it's like a few hundred followers. And it's like, <laughs> this isn't translating into anything long-term for you. This is just what's the value. Yeah. Of that. Yeah define the value. Cool. A bunch of people left. What is the value? Right. Uh, and if you try to put a dollar to laughs, well, the laughs aren't actually worth all that much. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, Vladimir, it's been awesome talking to you today. Uh, it's been amazing getting to know you and becoming friends with you and, and seeing the amazing work that you're doing. 
before we wrap up, first of all, I love to ask people about books. I can't remember if you said you're not a big reader or like actual book person. Oh, uh, the only book. Don't even read the book. Just read the, uh, the index or whatever you want to call it, the appendix. Whoever tells the best story wins. That's one. And the second book by Chris Matthews is called Life is a Campaign. Awesome. Uh, those two books probably define my life. Awesome. And then, uh, yeah, before we wrap up, I want to hand it over to you. Tell people where they can reach you on X, where they can buy robots from your robot school, uh, where they can find, buy T-shirts, anything you want to share, and then any thoughts you want to share as well. We're on a mission to teach 10 million kids to build robots. And we're going to clean up the world. And uh, if you want to teach your kids to build robots, go to myrobotschool.com and get started. And if you're an adult and you want to get into building robots, know that discovery and invention is not limited to children. I got into robotics in my 30s. I encourage you to do the same. Our build box for all ages will have you building robots with your kids by yourself and even programming your own devices, Wi-Fi, squirrel catchers, things like that, that you would only see in amazing videos online that you can do for under 30 bucks a month. Join us on this journey. We're giving it 100 days for 100% right now. What does that mean? It means we're taking 100% to put in everything that you got. If for 100 days you did that thing that you say you would do, what would that be? I challenge you to do that for 100 days and do it on X together with us. And we're going to make X amazing. We're going to clean up the world. We're going to teach kids to build robots. I welcome you on this journey. And uh, I'm making a 100-foot wide sticker to celebrate this. And I'm taking it from Toronto down to Texas to give to Elon Musk. So join us on this journey. It's 100 days of giving it 100%. And that's what I want you to do as well. Because any less, and you're not doing yourself justice. Awesome. Uh, Real quick about the robot kits. I, I just want to clarify so listeners know they're not like a robot kit where you buy it and you get instructions where it's like you're building this exactly. It's like whatever you yeah. want to make with it, right? So these are, yeah, these are build uh, these are uh, build boxes. So you get a bunch of materials and from each kit, you can build several different things. What we do is we call it inspiration over instruction. We'll show you some pictures of things other people did. We'll inspire you. We got some videos to show you cool stuff. But we're not going to tell you what to build. And what you'll find is actually deciding what to build is half of the battle. And when you get to choose what to build yourself, it will matter that much more. And you're going to care that much more about finishing it. So we encourage that we create the situation for you to do that. So when you get the build box subscription every month, you're using your creativity to build robots that you know really do robotic stuff. Um, it's pretty straightforward, honestly. You want to learn to build robots? Go to myrobotschool.com. And uh, that's about it. Awesome. Vladimir, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I appreciate you having me, man. The, the kind of legends that you have on this podcast, the fact that I'm included is an absolute honor. Right. Thank you. <laughs>